welcome everyone. Um, we have up next Caroline Blaker uh, doing I Cured My Imposter Syndrome using this one weird trick. Caroline's been an EE community member for quite a while now and a good friend of mine. So uh, we're excited to have her talk. Thank you. Hi, you guys. I'm Caroline, and I'm here right now because I had imposter syndrome, and now I don't. And I haven't for a while, so I'm pretty convinced it's gone. Oh, hello. Um, and this presentation is intended um, to tell you about that process and the things that I did that unwittingly, I'm certain, resulted in this awesome riddance. Um, because while I didn't ultimately take on the self-improvement project of getting rid of my imposter syndrome, I did do something really purposefully that I'll tell you about that yielded an imposter syndrome cure as a side effect. Uh, sometime during that process, it just got up and took a walk and never came back. And sometime later, I noticed it still wasn't there. Before we get started, I should let you know that we could be playing with a bit of fire here as far as possible triggers go. Um, I've done my best with this list to identify them. If you don't want to deal with this stuff right now, I completely understand, and you won't be judged for leaving. Um, they're presenting next door on let go and let the user, um, and he's offered me a deal. And if you go in there and you mention that you are the user, he'll give you, uh, in, no, just kidding, don't do that. <laughs> um, as I said, my name is Caroline C. Blaker. And I run a small web studio with approximately one employee called Petroglyph Creative out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, the land of roadrunners and green chili, as we had for lunch. Um, I am an expression engine web developer, business owner, partnered mom, person in the world that generally likes to be comfortable, fed, and reasonably entertained. Um, and I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my foray with EE started in 2008, version 1.6.3. And I attended my first Expression Engine conference back in 2011 when it was called EECI. And I don't write add-ons or give a whole lot back in the material sense to the community, but once I filed this bug report that went totally AWOL. Um, it was ridiculous. Expression Engine and its surrounding community have acted in amazing uh, ways in my life, not the least of which is offering me a career that I love. Um, so to the conference organizers for bringing us all together today, thank you. Uh, to Ellis Lab for keeping Expression Engine in the world, thank you. And to you all joining me here on what is it, my very first major conference talk, thank you. I am so grateful. I am not a doctor, and none of this talk is meant to be a substitute for medical care or to be taken as medical advice. And since it's mostly a personal story, uh, there shouldn't be a lot of confusion. Still, though, the topic does uncomfortably breach the medical side of personal stories. And I'm here advocating what could be taken to be one lay person's take on mental health strategy. So it would be ideal uh, to make sure that I check my facts. So I have. I've fact checked this talk with a few key actual scientists, uh, including this one. He is a board certified psychiatrist who's serving in as interim behavioral health director at the clinic he works at in Albuquerque. And up until recently served as chief of staff for three years at the same place. He is also my husband, and he is attending the conference, and he's sitting right there, Dr. Travis Townsend. And I'm not trying to embarrass him, but his birthday is Sunday. <laughs> um, and we will be here till then, so if you get those paper hats on and you feel like bursting out with happy birthday, just make sure he's within earshot. So happy birthday, Travis. Um, this talk is about my story and about your story and about discovering the things it takes to unravel one of the tech industry's biggest knots. Uh, one person at a time. Um, it's a knot that nobody's doing anything about because nobody can do anything about it collectively, either because they are not empowered or not aware of how, but today I can soundly say that I'm happy to be both. And so I will share with you what I know. By speaking about imposter syndrome and how I got to it to evacuate my life completely, I'm hoping to bring around firstly the notion that it can be cured and also the notion that every person who suffers from imposter syndrome has a role in its cure. Uh, put together, to put together this material, I created a public anonymous survey that procured 66 responses um, when spread around my network. Did any of you see it and fill it out? Awesome, thanks so much. 
Um, the vast majority of respondents had imposter syndrome and worked in tech, so it in no way achieved its ideal objective of, say, thousands of responses, allowing me to compare experiences with imposter syndrome symptoms and events between parties that have it and don't have it, um, or even genders or age groups. But someone who I know did fill it out, they said, I was filling it out, and oh my gosh, I didn't know I had this. Uh, it may have been the only time this happened on this go-round, and I don't know if this person did report that they had it when they got to that question, uh, because as we chatted, clearly she now knows that she does have it, um, but it took, in taking the survey initially, she thought she did not. The data isn't perfect, even in the mathematical interpretation, but it did achieve one objective, the catharsis of telling the truth. Um, the people who did respond appeared to be motivated by the topic to engage, which speaks to the levels of which people are struggling with this. But check this out. The form started with five questions about having symptoms of imposter syndrome, and then this question. How often do you experience the above? Exactly zero people said they never experienced this. 9.1%, so maybe five or six people who responded feel this every day. Even more than the, it's been a while, people, close to half of respondents feel this is always lurking. And even more experience this on a daily or weekly basis. Imposter syndrome is different for everyone, but as far as run-of-the-mill definitions, this will do. It's taken directly from Wikipedia, and that QR code should lead you to the right place if you're interested in reading about the official ins and outs of this condition. So just to summarize, uh, persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud, remaining convinced that you are a fraud despite external evidence that it isn't true, incorrectly attributing your success to lack of luck or deception, a uh, deception that you engineered over the people around you, uh, having them believe that you're smarter than you actually are. Out of 66 respondents, 57 say they have imposter syndrome. Out of the respondents that work in tech, all but two answered yes or maybe to having imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome in tech is a pronounced thing, but it reaches across all industries. Most of my survey respondents worked in tech, but even more than that say they have imposter syndrome. It's not a mental disorder, but a condition that presents a pile of complications, some of which may be diagnosable. People with imposter syndrome may also suffer from anxiety and or depression independently from their imposter syndrome. This definition confirms what we all know about it, but taking one step back into the abstract, into critical opinion, could you possibly design a better thing to defeat good people? Um, successful people who work hard to develop their character using their own experience in the world? Successful people who hold their observed truth of the external world accountable for how they see themselves? Seriously, if you were a strategist trying to keep down people who worked hard to be wonderful to others, useful in this world, self-fulfilled, empowered, and this was your implementation strategy, what would you change about it before you deployed? Like nothing, right? And so the way that tech knows to solve a problem, to dive into it, to get to know its components and to think really hard about multiple moving parts at once doesn't really help. In fact, it kind of backfires, doesn't it? This mindset that we take to work every day, that we've developed over months or years to perfect and hone our competitive advantages as developers may be setting us up unwittingly to stay stuck in imposterism, or at least in the quicksand effect, where Staying still isn't helping, but getting out the only way we know how only makes it worse. This is our catch-22, where we struggle against our own fears of inadequacy, which then leads us to feeling more inadequate or false. We're solving problems for our clients, being marketable, useful developers, but not letting any of the credit for that actually get in. And furthermore, it upsets us that we feel so lousy and so we're getting upset at being upset. In attempting to figure out why we feel like imposters for succeeding, we do what tech people do. We break it down. The components and moving parts that we can trace in our imposter syndrome are emotional constructs built from some unknown amount of exaggerations and falsehoods, yet look like the truth, taken at face value. So the small components 
that we can actually identify reinforce the imposter syndrome. And so from efforts like breaking it down, we're left feeling even more convinced that we're imposters and that there would be nothing to do about it. We're, we've managed to continue our charade over and above actually being smart or capable. We're convinced that we're hiding out as fraud somehow managing to keep it a secret. And believing it and being in a mind that filters out true believable positive feedback. Our hijacked feelings about ourselves can become worse than the feelings and convictions that set us up. Going deep into the reasons why we may not believe we deserve all the success that we have only just serves up more false positives that we don't deserve it. And imposter syndrome continues its self-service. It's a struggle characterized by struggling or struggling with our struggling or struggling with our struggling with our struggling and so on. No amount of professional success mitigates the struggle, particularly when you don't feel like your success is deserved or earned or real. There's no struggling your way out of imposter syndrome. So like any good syndrome, it keeps you along for the ride with no self-evident way out. <sighs> Many of us have gone the conventional help route. Science, specifically counseling and psychiatry, offers a typical behavior management strategies here, or at least in the short term. There are therapies that work for things, and going to a provider with imposter syndrome will likely yield ideas for therapeutic behaviors and a strategy for changing your reactions to your thoughts. And it may help relieve the symptoms like fatigue or anxiety for a while, but it may not stop imposter syndrome from spontaneously presenting itself and getting in our own way when we're blissfully not paying it any mind for once. So with this approach, we continue to struggle with it just less intensely maybe even trading stress for effort, uh, which is still a struggle and slightly more controlled one. Even if it's made easier to bear, imposter syndrome will still have the upper hand. Therefore, no matter how we approach this, we struggle sort of at the whims of our imposter syndrome whenever we're at a task when it likes to show up, usually in the midst of a real challenge that we may not have seen coming. We lose hours or days of work at a time. We try to distract ourselves. We try to figure out why we feel like imposters. The struggle makes it worse. There's some fellowship in the struggle and sometimes we think about bugging our friends. And then all of these hijacked negative thoughts start to run free again. Maybe they're worse off than me and I don't want to sound like I'm bragging or throw it in their face. Uh, do they even care? Uh, if they deny my imposter syndrome truth, will I believe them? Do I even have imposter syndrome? Suddenly we have imposter syndrome kicking up about our imposter syndrome. And fellowship helps because it furnishes, at least temporarily, an alternate refreshed reality, right? Um, but do you know what else it does? It convinces us a little bit at a time that our imposter syndrome will last forever. Um, and there's a really good reason for this. If it is your reality, and your friend's reality, and the reality of all these people around you, it stands to reason that this can be a condition of the work you do, the life you live, or just actual reality. And imposter syndrome doesn't need a prompt to take this reasoning to extremes. So we all identify with this. This is true and real, and everyone who has ever grown from an experience has felt this like concrete. It's the truth. With or without imposter syndrome, this is real. It's important to make something really clear here. Feelings of inadequacy that pervasively overload us with their presence, even when we were fine five minutes before, are not helpful. The moment they overtake that threshold where they stop being motivating and start being confusing, distracting, even heartbreaking or medically significant, well, suddenly we're in the throes of the condition and that's not helpful. If you suffer from imposter syndrome, it's a pay special attention to your tendency to weigh this sentiment against how you feel because it's exactly that that can enable imposter syndrome to take its edge over us. Imposter syndrome works on us because we believe it. We believe our own thoughts and projections and imposter syndrome takes the form of the truth, exaggerating it using our fears and doubts and bundles it all up and offers, up it up, ugh, offers it up as a thought that we ourselves have that we don't notice is a fictitious construction created and made up entirely of our fears and projections with zero or only selective supportive experience. 
It introduces negative possibilities, what if, that are seriously worth worrying about. It takes our personal narrative for a ride, replacing neutral or growth experiences with negative tainted memories and motivates us to act on those instead. It capitalizes on our confusion and fear over what we're dealing with and opens the door to you don't deserve and you can't actually do. We believe it because it has access to our truth and we're not aware that the experience isn't authentic. When you have imposter syndrome, it skillfully combines your truth with lies and exaggerations that can skew your perspective on your own memory. And the same memory draws, the same memory, by the way, that it draws on for the truth, it can write. This can become too much for anyone. If you leave your work under the weight of being convinced by yourself that you are subpar, which is a legitimate thing to do because self-torture is still torture, and some respondents, survey respondents actually have, you're going to be subpar in comparison to your potential because you think you are, regardless of what you actually are or can be. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So let's break it down. Imposter syndrome is a struggle characterized by struggling. It creates exaggerations and lies on our truth that can go all the way to reformulating our truth. It promotes harmful feelings and mind spaces, and it'll take everything with it, starting with job performance and going as far as it will. So let's beat it. If we were to take this and flip it upside down in order to design a cure, we would be convinced of the merits of our own performance independently of our shortcomings, not to see or observe uh, these merits, but actually accept them as they are communicated to us or observed at least neutrally. We would reliably carry good or promotive optimistic feelings but, uh, for just about anything. Um, uh, we would be objective and we would have a reliable perspective to ourselves that is generous, forgiving, or even loving, and it, there would be no struggle associated with any of this. In my experience of curing my imposter syndrome, this is exactly what it looked like. How, you might ask. Once upon a time, about 18 months ago, my family was coming for a visit. I had always struggled with my relationship with them, particularly in the area of boundaries. It seemed that I was always on the losing side of the requests, the tensions, the exchanges, things like what topics we could talk about, who gets to decide one thing or another, who gets to kick whom out of the kitchen, whose promises to whom mattered. These personal struggles were always on the table, but they were never won by me. So on this time, I decided I would not set forth any boundaries on this visit and sort of just see how it went, seeing as they were always battleground and just take it from there. It didn't take long for the trouble I was trying to avoid to start bubbling up. It seemed like what, wherever there were no boundaries evident, they would be asked after. And when I would answer with the requested boundary, they would run them down. Everyone from the bounds of their personal space to whose opinion was valid. There were so many instances of this that it's just impossible to describe them all without, while keeping this topic buoyant and optimistic. Suffice to say that I was insulted directly, my boundaries were expertly sleuthed out and stomped on, and my feelings were completely ignored over and over again, like it's what fed their happiness. What made, it's what made the visit good for them. They planned to leave at night, and last 45 minutes was a doozy, guys. They hadn't packed, and they were loudly crashing, banging, uh, snarling at each other. And I stood there, like, grinding my teeth, like, squeezing in a chair and, like, a half hug from Travis. And I listened as two angry people tried not to fight while they exchanged property, stubbed their toes, spilled things, uh, made excuses for unkept promises, dragged heavy objects, and blamed each other all the way out the door with only a half goodbye. And when they left, I felt no relief. Um, and I took an inventory of my feelings and realized that I felt completely trampled, which was the feeling I'd been trying to avoid by not offering outright boundaries to my guests. Uh, the plan had succeeded in its mission, that it took one extra step for them to purposefully uh, get what they needed. The trampled feeling itself, though, was cause for defeat. 
um, as they had managed to do it again, whatever it was, and I had no power to stop it, like all in the name of family, right? But why were they doing this to me? And what could I do to make them stop? I reached out for help mostly to unqualified people, but I did get a good bit from someone who followed up on the drunk alcohol story bite. All the while during their visit, my family had consumed some crazy number of glass bottles worth of stuff, and it was strewn all around the garage, and I complained about this. After setting me up somewhat perfectly, she asked if one of the parties involved was an alcoholic. I denied it actively for about 45 seconds, until, or at least until all of my family-sanctioned excuses ran out, and then I don't remember the rest of the conversation as the floodgate holding back like old memories burst forth, sort of like a child's surprise party. At the time, I knew that being an alcoholic was bad, but more so, I knew that it was worthy of denial. And it was really more of a joke to be one than a very serious problem, so my intermediate denial was consumed by a memory of once telling one of them, their scotch in hand when I was like 11, 12, that they were an alcoholic. I also remembered the denial storm and faintly remembered the extended retaliation that followed. It was the last time I had looked at alcohol as a factor in our disagreements. But it supported the theory. Uh, seeking out immediate support for this revelation was the right thing to do. I was in Al-Anon that night. Everybody was heard of, has heard of AA, but Al-Anon is, is the same thing, but for the family and friends of alcoholics. It was here that I experienced a massive breakthrough. Not only were these people alcoholics, but my reaction, my upbringing, my social problems, awkwardness, my abnormal needs. These were 100% normal for people suffering from the abuse of an alcoholic. Not only that, but it had a name. It had a name. Its name is alcohol disease. Now, you might think that alcoholics would be as diverse in their abuses as they themselves are, but that's not the case. The abuses of alcoholics on their loved ones set them up for, with like a unit, like a molecule of uniform diagnoses, like depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. You're also increasingly likely to obsess over their behavior, keeping yourself safe, keeping them safe, and scaling up from there. Compounded by each other while acting in concert with one another, all of these originate in the relationship with the alcoholic. We obsess over their drinking or their hurtful, embarrassing behavior. We get anxious about it. We get depressed about what appears to be their increasing distance from us and their indifference to our love and affection. But over a longer period of time, this gets worse, and they become love languages. Codependence takes over, and the longer we stay in there with this person, the more awful, the more these in awful interdynamics become measures of devotion. I'm sure you can imagine how difficult it is to break away from something like this, but it includes a complete redefinition of relationships in your life and ultimately it redefines what love is. And in this transformation, without the alcoholic's own commitment to recovery, you can't take them with you. The first step for me was the first step in Al-Anon, to get to a place where I realized that I was completely powerless over their actions. That ch this changes the lens of your relationship with the alcoholic and all relationships fundamentally. All those ways you were weird, corrupted, cracked, broken, lost, were adjustments you made to survive what was ultimately an abusive relationship. And then the moment you've been waiting for arrives, the first one you've possibly ever felt where you can choose to never, ever live that way ever again. So this is what I did that May. And by August, I noticed on the offhand that my imposter syndrome had gone away. It still hasn't resurfaced. My trauma was alcohol disease, and treating it effectively began a cascade of healthy readjustment life changes with many symptoms, one being the ushering out of my imposter syndrome. Now it's your turn. In my electronic show of hands, I got great data from lots of you and a few more people in other industries. Let's take a look. The graph is the question, do you have imposter syndrome? The one at the top is all respondents. The one in the bottom left is, yes, I have imposter syndrome, or maybe I have imposter syndrome. The one on the 
bottom right is, yes, or maybe I have imposter syndrome and I work in tech. These only vary by a couple of votes, but you can see that the tendency to feel like an imposter increases if you have imposter syndrome and if you work in tech. This doesn't vary wildly from the narrative that is out there about tech workers being plagued by imposter syndrome. Do people praise you too highly if you work in tech and have imposter syndrome? You're more likely to think so. Take a look at that yellow no segment. It shows a clear trend. Do you sometimes feel undeserving of your success? If you work in tech and have imposter syndrome, you're more likely to feel this. If you look at that red no segment, it shows a clear trend. Have you ever not tried something because somebody else might do it better? Finally, here, tech gets a boost. Looks like imposter syndrome in tech had slightly fewer yeses, speaking perhaps to the empowerment granted by code and computers. These charts are almost identical. The on, there are only a few, participation, a few participants difference, but the green turquoise and uh, they, sw they swapped it on top. It's actually the purple one. Um, green turquoise, purple on top, and red panels along with the green are more associated with imposter syndrome than the orange, yellow, or purple turquoise. The traumas. Nine respondents didn't answer or had no trauma. In my opinion, the most important question here was sort of the opposite of trauma, which is, have you lived in an environment for any period of time which meets your standards for the characterization unconditional love? And it's that big green bar with the number 24. And this primordial soup of human kindness, healing can happen. And not only because you recognize that there's such a thing in the world, but also because this environment, you can break from your trauma, which is the seed to seeing the trauma as other, separate from yourself, rather than as your default condition. I realize this font is really small, and I hope everyone who's interested in reading this is close enough to do that. Also, this graph is beautiful and was generated by Google Forms, and I'm not sure why, but it doubled some lines. So if you want to see the data, I'll offer it later as part of the follow-up here. Nine respondents didn't answer or had no trauma. The rest of the reported feelings are mapped on this graph. Same deal, it, it duplicated them. I'm not entirely sure why. I'd only noticed this yesterday, so I didn't have my big screen to like refactor the graph. Sorry about that. Um, included some feelings here that did not immediately associate with imposter syndrome, just to shake things up a bit. But as you can see, hope, happiness, and encouragement were not very closely associated with imposter syndrome by the respondents. Out of 66 respondents, a whopping 37 associated fear and anxiousness. Sadness, discouragement, despair, apathy. Geez, these are all very high counts for a group of people not filtered out by imposter syndrome or tech. Six respondents didn't have imposter syndrome still responded somewhat like people that do have imposter syndrome. This isn't a full set of graphs on this sector, but I grabbed these because it shows you that this group in some ways responded like people with imposter syndrome, as evidenced on the top pie graph, yet almost exclusively never felt guilty for having too much. So that's a no in the red, and it's a, you feel guilty for having too much. It's a no in the red and a maybe for this little, for the two sector right there. One of the lesser opted symptoms, and all responded that they might have felt at least one of the telltale symptoms of imposterism sometime in their lives. What I really dig about this is that I would be inclined to say that it shows a trend, that some of the symptoms of, imposter, of imposterism are more normalized. Like the feeling that an imposter, like feeling like an imposter once in a while or leaving it up to someone who could do better. I've definitely done that lots of times. Uh, it's easier to validate when you're prioritizing time management, say, over, um, over ventures, because we don't have time to do everything we want, and so leaving it up to someone who could do it better is kind of like killing two birds with one stone. The data seems to say that feelings of being praised too highly or guilty feelings associated with having too much are surer signs of imposter syndrome than some of the other symptoms. So now we've looked at some data and we've broken down imposter syndrome and it's time to relieve it from our lives. But it, this is going to take some planning and some conscientious effort. Understanding imposter syndrome is like, as an individual battle, despite industry-wide affect it appears to have, is the first step. Uh, you, could, you have what it takes to cure your imposter syndrome. 
Nobody said it would be easy, but I promise it's going to be worth it. Realize that you may have trauma. If this notion isn't quite squaring with you, or you don't know where or what it is, you may be like me. I had a major lifelong blinder to alcohol disease that affected me that was my trauma. Recognizing my trauma as real and deciding that I never had to live with it ever again was what set in motion a curative chain of revitalizing mentalities that cured my imposter syndrome on its off time. Seek help for it. Or, if that's too much, just show some interest in it. There are free anonymous groups, therapies, for just about every kind of trauma out there, whether it be cancer or car accidents, uh, loved ones lost, violent trauma, and many of them are open. If you're not sure that your trauma belongs to a group but the meeting is open, just go. You don't even have to say anything. Uh, getting to know your trauma, if you have it, will change your personal outcomes, but also your treatment outcomes. Seeking treatment for just imposter syndrome will yield the sort of same old stuff, but if you go into a treatment situation with a trauma, you get so much more. While medications can help, with the reduction of symptoms a person may experience, they do not cure a person or make them forget. They simply allow them to work through their symptoms. This can help people to reduce anxiety through exposure or reduce depression through allowing them to create a wider social network. Th the with, th through, with therapy, uh, through therapy, a person can work on that specific trauma through a certain trauma-focused therapy, which can also reduce symptoms and help a person to cope with future symptoms, allowing them to become more aware of triggers, uh, aware of their, how their body responds, and to learn how to take actions to keep these from progressing. At the end of the... I think... Okay, so enough about trauma for the moment. What can we do if there's no trauma that you can work on, but yet still feel like you suffer from imposter syndrome, here's a couple of ideas. Uh, quit reinforcing your, uh, your imposter syndrome through quitting some behaviors, like lying is one of these. If you're in the habit of doling out untruthful statements as a means of dealing with people, you could be reinforcing your imposter syndrome. A commitment to stopping these behaviors would be in your best interest. Pick up a new unrelated hobby, actually suck at something, and see how much fun it is. <laughs> Compare that emotional landscape with your imposter syndrome-inducing work and just notice how wildly different they feel. Do a big free favor for someone who deserves it. This is one of the most effective ways to feel better about yourself and your skills. Does your imposter syndrome try to, try to eke in on this and kill this joy as well? It has no right to be here. If it tries, you have like a bona fide outlying situation where you can be absolutely sure that your feelings of inadequacy are manufactured by your imposter syndrome. And so you can objectify it and practice telling it to take a hike. Recontextualize slacking off. Sometimes, without your consent, your body and brain will demand a break from all this thinking. Giving in or planning to do so is not slacking off, but rather radical self-care going beyond what our humanized work lives and storylines demand from us to take care of something that powers it all is not weakness, it's strategy. So, I don't have imposter syndrome anymore. I mean, it went away, but what it really did was something more like break up into smaller parts uh, beyond recognition. I manage anxiety on a daily basis. And I have two PTSD, PTSD diagnoses from independent parties. This sounds worse, but I gotta tell you, it's been so much easier to deal with. Because it, I, it's no longer like a skyscraper of cohortive factors, but rather a pile of rubble that can be swept away and swept around and sort of dealt with a little tiny bit at a time. The medical community also gives anxiety a lot of attention. And, with, and as such, there are like a thousand things to try to gain the upper hand while pursuing your favorite flavor of condition management. It's not perfect, but at least it's on the way. At the end of the day, or the talk, why are we all so overtaken by this force? Science doesn't really have a reason, but if you think about it in the context of our timelines, you've sought out this web app coding thing, professionally probably, and one of the reasons you've stuck with it 
may be the sense of control that you have. You can control your code paired with the instant gratification of sending it live to the public forever. <laughs> you can control aesthetics, user experiences, and you have full reign over your learning and skill set. From the moment you learned what hypertext markup language looked like, you've been able to exert it to the public, wrapping it up with whatever you wanted to say, with none of your idiosyncrasies out to stop you. It's empowering. No matter what has happened in your life, or you've had no control, you found a thing that spontaneously restored a whole bunch of what you might have lost. And if this kind of power is something you've been missing in your life and deep down really wanted, chances are it's sung to you like a Broadway show with visions of the future, unlimited creativity, and the ability to implement and grow any idea you want. Do y'all remember having that moment? If you do, you may have hacked your trauma response. While sort of already riding along in your default state, suddenly there was this left turn at, oh sorry, left turn at Albuquerque that coding provided, and you left your trauma in the dust. But it didn't lose you. We experience some success with our coding or creative work. We get a job, clean up a project, what have you, and there's this moment of quiet. Maybe it's zen if you're into that. It's like we're taking a quick inventory of everything we've done and self-doubt emerges. Is it your trauma? Do you recognize it? Does it look completely different now that you've led the way for a while? Maybe it is your trauma. Maybe it's just that part of you that had you by the neck that just wants to be acknowledged and dealt with. Now that you're empowered and in control of your life with your awesome coding career, it still doesn't know how to ask nicely for you to spare some time to help it out. That may be all it wants. Let it be said in conclusion that if you have imposter syndrome and you're struggling to deal with it, here's a hack for you. Maybe gratitude is too strong a word, but notice, please, that this means that you have success. Imposter syndrome doesn't show up for people who have achieved nothing or not overcome anything. The phenomenon belongs only to people who are fighting the good fight for their success despite personal history of trauma. Imposter syndrome's convictions can't be right because without your success, it would never have become a thing. And that's all I have to say. Are there questions? Excellent. <laughs> what have you found, if, if this isn't too personal, what have you found to be most helpful to deal with it? The word trauma? The word trauma doesn't get me. Um, what gets me is recognize, like, it's so hard to see trauma in third party situations, mm -hmm. but when you're looking in on yourself, it's just me, and inadvertently, you can, you can find your trauma accidentally or you know, through, by being triggered by things people say in, like, innocently or perhaps maliciously, but um, pay, those, those things are, meant, are like your attention grabs, like pay attention to them. Um, is, does that answer what you mean? Like, like knowing that it's okay to, to have trauma and say that you have trauma, like denormalizing. The best, the thing to do about that is really to try to see it as not of you. Because the, when you own it, it's part of you. And you, you inadvertently protect it as part of you. Now, if you get to a place where you can objectify it and call it a separate entity, suddenly it exists to be dealt with. And it is not a part of you anymore. And you can use the energy you spent, had been spending, defending it to, um, to, to help deal with it as well as use the space it has left to fill your life with brand new things. And this has actually happened to me. Like, my business has grown like 100% since I started this process. It hasn't even been difficult. Like, it just showed up. 
because for some reason I was paying attention differently. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps people noticed it in me, it's hard to say. Um, but things changed after this and um, it's worth doing. Thanks for your question. Is there any more? Travis. You mean imposter syndrome? Oh God, it's been so long. I think I started with imposter syndrome in high school. Um, but I think, I think getting out of any situation that's reinforcing it is gonna be the, first, the early first step because if it's developing, it means that there's probably some sort of active situation. Um, and of course, as a child, if you're growing up in a household that's stressful like that, you don't have that choice. So you sort of have to just be smart about it. Um, if you can see that it's not your fault first, um, even if you feel like it is, it, it's not. <laughs> Um, you, you sort of have to get into a mindset of self-coaching almost. And that's really hard for kids, it's really hard for young adults. Um, just, you sort of have to have a certain level of maturity to kick this off. And as soon as you realize you're there, then that's the time to start. Last one? Oh, all right, thanks guys. <laughs>